Thank you, Brother Mohammed. My name is Luqman Tijani. I am a graduate student in the School of Business. I am also the Vice Pre President of the Muslim Student Association. It's a pleasure to be here tonight to welcome Sister Nancy Ali to uh, talk about her experiences from Christianity to Islam. Sister Nancy Ali is married with two daughters. She has a BS in Microbiology from the University of Pittsburgh. She is actively involved with the Islamic Foundation of Villa Park in Illinois. She was also a previous weekend school teacher of Islamic studies. She is also a writer for the newsletter Voice of Islam. She has been a Muslim for 12 years and has been active in Islamic work for the past 10 years. She was born and raised a Roman Catholic. She attended Catholic grade school and attended Mount Nazareth Academy High School. She joined and belonged to the Order of the Sisters of the Holy Family of Nazareth for four years and her name was Sister Mary Giovanni. She then left the convent one month before taking her final vows. She studied theology and Christology while in the convent and after five years she was introduced to Islam in 1977. Uh, Sister Nancy Ali will speak for 45 minutes after which the members of the audience will be given an opportunity to di direct questions to her through the microphone or you can write questions on pieces of paper that I will read to her. I will now introduce Sister Nancy Ali to you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin in the name of Allah, most kind, most merciful. And I greet you with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum which means peace be upon you. By the way, this is not, I shouldn't say that this is, is an Islamic greeting because actually this greeting is the greeting that Jesus used when he used to greet his disciples and apostles. He used to greet them with the greeting, peace be upon you. This is also a greeting that was used by Moses, Abraham, and David. I thank you for inviting me here tonight and it is with pleasure that I come here to share my religious experience with you as a Roman Catholic and now as a Muslim. In my opinion, I feel that all people, regardless of what religion they are, if they're Hindus, if they're Muslims, if they're Jews, if they're Christian, if they're Catholic, we're, we're all that because we were brought up that way. We grew up in that kind of a household and we did not, we were not what we were because of choice. It was because that's how we were born. Like me, for example, I was born in a Roman Catholic household all my life I went to Catholic schools, parochial schools. I went to a Catholic high school. And then by my own choice, I opted to go and join a convent for four years where I spent that much time of my life. Catholicism at times, I'm speaking of Catholicism now because that's the religion that I grew up in. Catholicism at times left me empty. And I think that was because Catholicism was a very ritualistic type of religion. When you went to church, most of the things were done in rituals, ceremonies. Even the sermon that was delivered on Sunday mornings by the priest dealt with the doctrines of the church. It wasn't giving you any guidance about what you were to do with your day-to-day -day living. So when I would leave the church on Sunday, I had nothing to carry me over until the following Sunday. So at that, at that interval, I really felt abandoned and empty. I, I suppose I really didn't uh, know what to do about that, that aspect of it, but I thought that perhaps I should pursue it further. And you probably think that I must be an idiot to have entered a convent feeling empty, feeling confused. Why would I want to do such a thing like that? Well, the reason was that I took religion very seriously. I always believed in God. I still believe in God, and God willing, when I die, I'll be believing in God. So I thought that maybe if I entered a convent, I would be able to find answers to questions that lay people don't get. 
Well, when I entered the convent, to my amazement, there were no answers there. The prayers were just the same, only we prayed more, more often. We did more rituals. We went to, and you know, the, the thing about Catholicism is that we were always praying through somebody. We were not praying directly to God. You were praying through Mary, or to Mary sometimes, because the Catholic Church used to say that Mary was the mother of God. Because the Catholic Church considered Jesus to be God, so they considered the mother to be mother of God. So we would be praying to saints also, to saints, to Mary. When we had to take repentance for our sins or feel sorry for our sins, we never could just feel sorry directly to God. We had to go to a priest on a Saturday afternoon, had to go to the confessional, had to kneel in front of a human being and, and confess our sins to him. And somehow or another, the church said that he had the power of God to forgive my sins and, and give me a penance or a, a punishment for that. So this is, this is how Catholicism was as a religion. Well, in the convent, it was really amusing because I don't know if any of you know about convent life, but convent life is a very demanding one. And it demands self-sacrifice and prayer, self-sacrifice and prayer. You have no possessions of your own. You give everything you own up to the church. You have no freedom to conduct your own business. And basically, you're, it, like, it's like you join the army. You're the property of the army. You become the property of the church. So I was, I was in that lifestyle for four years. And I thought, uh, well, something, something will come out of it for me. I just know that I'm going to get some sort of an answer. Well, I didn't. And then I thought to myself, what am I doing here? I'm praying 24 hours a day to God. Is this what God really wants of me? It was such an um, impractical life. I wasn't doing anything for anyone. I was just praying and praying and praying. And I didn't know half the time what I was even saying or who I was praying to. So I decided at that point that I better leave religion alone for a while. And so I left the convent a year before I was to take my final vows. In my... Um, okay, I thought to myself, you know, at that point, that God was really irreproachable. That, you know, here I am, a human being, and God created me. And somehow or another, I just can't communicate with him. If I want to go to God directly, it's impossible. If you have to go through Jesus. You have to go through um, saints. You have to go through Mary. And then, you know, the Catholic Church always preached. When they talked about God, they always talked about a triune God three persons in one God. So you were either praying to God the Father, and that was considered to be the Creator, God the Son, who was the only begotten Son sent down to earth to die for our sins, or the Holy Spirit who was the one who inspired you. So you were always dealing with three, not, never one. So I never, I, I used to wonder, what God am I supposed to pray to? You know, when I went to pray, I thought, well, am I supposed to be praying to God the Father here? Or am I supposed to be praying to Jesus or the Holy Spirit? And I was totally confused. So, I left religion to the scholars because it seemed that they were the only ones who knew the answers. And I left the convent. I went out. I started, I joined the University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> And when I was at the university, I met a lot of interesting people. And they were not all Catholics. They were from all different sorts of religious backgrounds. And so we used to get into a lot of discussions with one another about religion. Well, I always used to ask them, the first question I would ask them is, who do you pray to? When we would talk, when we'd really get into it, I'd say, well, who do you pray to? And the Jew would say to me, well, I pray to God. There is no one else. When I would ask the Christian, who do you pray to? He, would, he or she would say, well, he, I pray to God, I pray to Jesus. And then when the question would come back to me, they'd say, well, who do you pray to? I would say, I don't know. I really don't know who I pray to. I'm, I'm very confused. Then I met a Christian friend who said to me, well, I think your problem is that you just don't understand Christianity. You have to accept Jesus as your personal savior in that he died for your sins, and through him, you will get eternal life. And also along with that, he said, I think you should read the Bible. 
Well, that, that, that appealed to me, and I'll tell you why it appealed to me. Because the Catholic Church never encouraged us to read the Bible. We were not allowed to read the Bible, as a matter of fact. That was a book only for the theologians. They, they were to read it, they were to interpret it, and then they were to tell us what it meant. So I thought, well, this, this is interesting. I think I'm going to do that. Well, I started to read the New Testament, and I found to my surprise that more was written about Jesus than what he actually said himself. I also found out that the Bible was written 63 years after the death of Jesus. To arrive at certain conclusions, I had to read the Bible and reread it because this was new to me. I found out what, that what Jesus actually said is different than what the theologians are teaching us today. For example, nowhere in the New Testament did Jesus say with his own words that he is God or that he's God's son. He didn't say that about himself. Someone may have said it about him in the Bible, <clears throat> but he never uttered those words himself. And if he, even if someone said it about him, I thought, so what? Because when I read the Old Testament, it said in there, God says in the Old Testament, Israel, you are my only begotten son. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Adam is called the son of God when it's talking about the genealogy of Jesus from, you know, from where he came, from where he came, from where he came. Well, it goes back to Adam and it calls Adam the son of God. Then when Jesus had the Sermon on the Mount, everybody, anyone who's Christian is probably familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount with the eight Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So in the Bible, there are tons of sons. So even if somebody said that about Jesus, it really it doesn't, doesn't make him the only true son of God or biological son of God. Jesus never asked his followers to pray to him. On the contrary, when, one of his, when his people asked, how should we pray, he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He didn't say, I'm the Father or I'm God, hallowed be my name. So he was saying, it's my God, it's your God. He never claimed to be anyone's personal savior. From his own lips, those words never came. He was not a personal savior. He did never say that he had a human nature and a divine nature. Things that like this were said about him in the Bible, but they were never really said by, Christ, by Jesus. He never mentioned the concept of a trinity. He, said, he never said, I'm one of three gods. Worship me. When I finished my study of the Bible, I concluded that Christianity, as preached by Jesus is different than what the theologians are teaching us. It's a series of doctrines brought about 300 years after the death of Jesus at the Council of Nicaea. At the Council of Nicaea, this was a very political council. A bunch of theologians, they got together, they said, well, what should we do about this? So they took Jesus and they did what they pleased. They made him a god, they made him part of a trinity. But did he ever say that? If you read the Bible and you read his words, he never said it. He never said it. Now, the doctrines that were... Um, invented by the theologians, I have to say invented because Jesus never said any of them himself, are the Trinity, salvation, original sin, and baptism, and I'll put those two together because they kind of go hand in glove, the divinity of Jesus and blood atonement. Now if we take the Trinity, what did Jesus say about, did Jesus say anything about the Trinity? To the contrary. When one of the scribes, this is directly from the Bible I quote you, when one of the scribes asked Jesus, which commandment is the first, he replied, Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one.
Now, does this sound like a triune God? Does it sound like he's implying that there's any trinity? He says there's one God. The Lord our God is one God. When it comes to salvation, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, And one came to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? Only one is good. If you would enter eternal life, keep the commandments. So here Jesus said that following the commandments of God is what's going to get you eternal life. He did not say that I'm going to die for you, I'm going to shed my blood for you, and through me you're going to have eternal life. He didn't say that. About original sin and baptism, blood atonement is something that seems to be to have been done from the beginning of time when people started to worship God the sacrifice was there of blood the blood atonement and there came a time when the children of Israel were displeasing God a lot in their behavior but they were off giving a lot of burnt offerings to compensate for that but thinking that that was going to wash away their sins that they were committing so in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 it says the, the son shall not suffer oh wait no this is not this is about uh, original sin okay original sin let's take original sin I'm sorry I got off the track original sin is considered to be the sin that was inherited by Adam and Eve through Adam and Eve the church says that every newborn child is born with this original sin on their soul and that a cleansing process called baptism is going to take that sin away. Now, tell me, we say that God is a just God. We say that God is a merciful God. Tell me what God would put a sin on a newborn child who's done nothing wrong. In their, in their whole life. They haven't had, a, haven't had a chance to do anything wrong. They were just born. It doesn't make any sense. And even in the Bible, in, in Ezekiel, I'll quote you, chapter 18, verse 20, it says, The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteous of the righteous... The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So in other words, everybody is going to be responsible for their own deeds. If they're bad deeds, they're going to get the punishment. If they're good, they'll get the reward. But you're not going to inherit anybody's sin. About blood atonement, God discouraged it in the Old Testament. He got sick and tired, as I said before, of the burnt offerings, the misbehavior of the children of Israel, the defiance. They massacred prophets, God's prophets, and they were offering, offering uh, lambs and rams and he goats. So God said to, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11 through 17, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings, of your rams, and of the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or he goats. When you come to, to appear before me, who requires of you the trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. And then he goes on to say how to do that by taking care of the orphan, giving to the poor, clothing the naked, and things that, things that are practical, but don't come to my altar with your, with your lambs because that's not going to do any good. So the blood atonement was wiped out there, and now if you take it a little bit further, would God turn around then and say, I'm going to send you a son though later on, and he's going to, sh uh, he's, he's going to shed his blood. He's going to have to die and bleed for you so that you can go to heaven. I mean, he gets rid of the blood atonement, and then he's going to bring it back by sending a son. It doesn't make any sense. So after reading the Bible, 
See, I was reading the Bible, honestly, not to criticize it, believe me. I was looking for wisdom. I was looking for knowledge. I was looking for truth. I was not looking at the Bible to criticize or scrutinize it, but this is what I found. So, this left me more confused, so I had to put the religion on the back burner because it was really getting to me. I, I just couldn't take it anymore, and uh, so I just went about my normal life. I graduated from college. I got married. And then 14 years ago, a Muslim friend and I were taught, had a discussion about religion. She was a friend of mine, and we just happened to get into this conversation. So I told her about the conclusions that I arrived at about Catholicism. So she told me a little about, a bit about her religion, Islam. She said that they believed in one God and in all of God's messengers, such as Adam and Abraham and Moses and David and Jacob and Jesus and Muhammad, who they believed to be the last prophet sent to mankind. They believe in angels. They believe in the revealed books, such as the Torah, the Bible, and the Psalms of David. They also believe in the Day of Judgment. So this was my first light encounter with Islam. So I told my friend, I said, could you give me something to read? I said, I'm, I'm kind of doing a personal study of comparative religion, and I'd like to read a little bit about your your religion and she said sure so she gave me a copy of the Quran and she gave me a complimentary book about Islam in general you know how do Muslims live and what are their basic beliefs and how do they worship I found three unique things out well first what I did was I took this basic book and I read a little bit of the history about the Quran before I started reading the Quran itself because any re any uh, revealed book or religious book is going to be hard to read if you don't know its background. So I read this book and I found three unique things out about the Quran. To my surprise, I found that the Quran was not a written book and it didn't have any authors. It didn't have a human author. It's considered a revelation in its entirety with only one author who is God. Many people who who don't know too much about Islam, they think that Muhammad wrote the Quran or he was the author of the Quran. That is not true. There is no author. Allah, God, is the author. That's the one unique thing I read uh, that touched me. The second was that the Quran has been, has been unaltered since it's, it has been revealed. 1410 years ago, the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad. It has never been changed by a letter or a word. And, it's, and, you know, the unique thing about that is that the Quran was never in the hands of scholars. It was always in the hands of the people. Any Muslim had, every Muslim has a copy of the Quran, and every Muslim had a copy of the Quran. So it was always among the people. Even then, they never, they never changed it. They never altered it. And the other third thing about the Quran that I found unique is that it's not a book in its written for form only, but it's also memorized by Muslims. It's committed to memory. It was committed to memory by Prophet Muhammad and his companions. And to this day, the tradition of memorization continues. They have special schools for this. Many, many children under the age of five are in the process of memorizing the Quran from cover to cover. And what this accomplishes is two things. If something is written on paper, it can be destroyed. Someone can burn it, someone can throw it in the river, they can do whatever they want with it. But if millions or thousands of people memorize something, you can't find them all and burn them. So the Quran will always be preserved in the sense that somebody's got it committed to heart. So that's one of the, and God in the Quran himself said that he will preserve this book. Don't worry about it. He's telling the Muslims, don't worry, I'll preserve it. And, it, and that's how it's been preserved. So it's kind of like an ultimate miracle in itself. When I read the Quran, I discovered that I was not reading a new message, but the same message that was preached by Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Isaac, Ishmael, and Jesus. The same message was given to Muhammad, who, by the way, happens to be a descendant, a direct descendant of Abraham through his son Ishmael. Some of, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a book called 
The Blood of Abraham. It's written by Jimmy Carter, President, ex-President uh, Carter. Well, if you get a chance to read it, it, it talks about how the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians are all related just by Abraham, who's called the father of nations. One entire chapter of the Quran is dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. She and her son are highly honored, highly praised, and highly respected by Muslims. In chapter 3 of the Quran, we read that God, the creator of heaven and earth, purified Mary and chose her above all women of all nations about, uh, and wi the woman of all times. The virgin birth is described in the Quran in clear terms. It says that he was created miraculously in the womb of Mary by the permission of God. His birth was as miraculous as the birth of Adam, who was, who was uh, created from clay without a mother or a father. The Quran gives us a proper and true meaning of the term that Jesus is a word from God. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is a word from God. Well, the Quran gives us the meaning of the term that Jesus is a word from God. The Quran tells us that Jesus was created by the creative word of God, and that word is be. The same creative word is mentioned in the Old Testament when God Almighty willed the creation of light. He said, let there be light, and it was. So this is the creative word be, and that was the creative word for Jesus. So from the Quranic perspective, by the will of God, Jesus was created in the womb of Mary, and the word be became flesh and dwelt among us to tell us that there is only one true God. The Quran teaches that Jesus raised the dead, cured the leper, healed the blind by God's permission. And Jesus also stated this himself in the Bible. He said, on my own authority, I can do nothing. In the Quran, Jesus is called a word from God, a spirit from God, a miracle from God, a sign from God, and a righteous prophet. And in the Bible, Jesus also called himself a prophet. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 57, Jesus said, this was in his own country, in his own synagogue, about himself, whom the Jews were in doubt about. He says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own home. And he did not do many works there because of their disbelief. So in that verse, Jesus has referred to himself as a prophet. The Quran gives Jesus all the dignity and praise as an obedient messenger of God, but it also rejects all forms of Trinity as well as the deification of Jesus or any other prophet, including Muhammad. There's no prophet in the Quran who is, said, who is deified or called God or part of a trinity. The Quran states about Jesus in chapter 4, verse 171, it says, Jesus, son of Mary, is no more than an apostle of God. And his word, which he bestowed on Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him, so believe in God and his apostles. Say not trinity, desist. It will be better for you for God is only one. Glory be to him, for exalted is he above having a son. After reading the Quran and other books about Islam, slowly I realized that the message of Islam is the exact same message preached and taught by Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jacob, Jesus, and Muhammad.